covered with bodies. Trifina Mohotzi's body was one of the 10 found there. The black community held a prayer vigil for the murdered women and demanded swift justice. As a black man in that community, if I know that you did that to my sister, my mother, my daughter, I'm not gonna wait for the police to come and give me any kind of justice. I will get people together and you will be punished. Inspector Leon Nell and his team canvassed a children's home called Kids Haven where Trifina had worked. Through her co-workers, police learned that on the day she disappeared, she had gone to meet a man named Moses Sitole. But Sitole is a common name in South Africa. So Nell returned to the facility and passed around a mugshot of a specific man, a Moses Sitole who had been arrested for rape in 1989. We showed it to uh, the people at Kids Haven, Esther Mushlangu, and the other relevant people that uh, pointed him out, and that's how we knew it was uh, Moses Sitole. Authorities finally knew the identity of the serial killer they had been seeking for over a year. But as investigators closed in, Sitole developed a new scheme to evade capture. He called members of the press in an attempt to gain information about the investigation. At six o'clock on October 2nd, 1995, the phone rang in the newsroom of the Johannesburg Star. Reporter Tamsin De Beer took the call. I answered the phone and I heard the words, I'm the man that everyone is looking for. The person on the other end of the line introduced himself as Joseph and claimed to be responsible for the murders. It was like alarm bells ringing in my head, like, get your typing fingers going, get your wits about you. De Beer quickly began to transcribe the call. Over the next days, she and the killer would have three lengthy conversations. He would call from a, a phone booth, and there was a degree of trust that we were building up. He was a very well-spoken, charming person on the, on the telephone. I mean, he had, a, he had an accent, so English wasn't his first language, so I imagine in his first language he was quite, quite charming. He told De Beer he was killing out of revenge for being wrongly convicted of rape. He claimed the murders were committed to draw attention to the injustice he had suffered. He didn't want to be caught by the police. That was, in fact, his motive for calling. He wanted to outsmart them. De Beer thought it might be a hoax, but the caller gave vivid descriptions of the killings. As the calls continued, Sitole confided more and more to 26-year-old De Beer. He described how some women would fight, other women would just give up. It was of some interest to him, I think, how certain women would respond and others would fight. I remember him saying that some women were as strong as men, and he really struggled with them. De Beer contacted the police and gave them transcripts of the conversation. Still, they were not certain that she was dealing with the actual killer. The next time Joseph called, she asked him to prove he was the serial murderer. He then told her the location of a body in the Eastern Rand area of Johannesburg that the police had not yet found. It wasn't a recent victim. He said there was a piece of metal um, over her body and that he had gone back and he had lifted up the piece of metal and found her there and she was basically a skeleton at this point. De Beer relayed the information to the authorities. After several searches, investigators discovered the woman in a veld outside Johannesburg. He then described where another body was, a relatively fresh one, that she was hanging half in a tree. Police found that body just as Joseph described. It was the killer's latest victim, a 31-year-old woman who had disappeared just the day before. Police were waiting nearby when Satole contacted De Beer for the third time. When the money ran out on Satole's payphone, De Beer asked for the number to call him back, and he gave it to her. Investigators traced the number to a nearby train station. De Beer kept Satole on the line while officers rushed to the station. He said, hang on, and the phone went dead. There was nothing. And I was, I remember, on the line going, hello, 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 hello. De Beer was upset. During the course of their phone conversations, she had begun to feel empathy for him. I was quite alarmed that perhaps the police had shot him. Um, and I remember thinking, 
No, shame, you know. This, this poor man out there, this lost, broken person, which of course he was, but he was also a monster. Satole was now on the run, and police were desperate to catch him before he killed again. On October 13, 1995, his photo appeared on television and in newspapers from Johannesburg to Pretoria. That evening, Tamsin De Beer's phone rang again. This Joseph character basically shouted at me about how could I have done that? But what did I do? We had a relation, a trust going. I broke the trust. A few days later, Moses Atole got in touch with his brother-in-law, Maxwell Makabene. Hoping to get a gun, Makabene told Satole he would help. He arranged to meet Satole at the factory where he worked. Maxwell then called the police. Undercover police officer Francis Molovetsi was posted at the gate ready to arrest the murderer. When Satole arrived, he sensed the trap and fled. He ran into a dark alley. Officer Molovetsi was close behind. Suddenly, Sitole turned and took a swipe at the officer with an ax. In response, Molovetsi fired several shots. Sitole was hit in the abdomen and the leg. Police rushed him to the hospital. Vinyl Phil Hune tried to interrogate Sitoli, but he was uncooperative. I asked him, Moses, did we find all the victims? So his answer to me was, I don't know. And I started thinking, what does he mean by I don't know? So I asked him again, Moses, did we find all the victims? And he said to me, I don't know, because I wasn't with you. Investigators reasoned that since Sitoli's victims were women, a female detective might be better able to draw him out. The strategy worked. He became aroused at the thought of his crimes and masturbated while describing them to her. He started bragging to her how he killed them, how what he did, and that sort of thing. When asked why he raped and strangled 37 women, Moses Satole said, I did it to teach them a lesson. On October 18, 1995, serial killer Moses Satole was shot during his arrest. After recovering from his wounds, Satole was transferred to a prison near Pretoria to await trial. There, he received numerous death threats from angry citizens. Sitoli was heavily guarded by an elite police unit. Leon Nell remembers the tense situation. We uh, did not want anything to happen to Moses. We wanted to have a fair trial. While in prison, a fellow inmate, Derek Schoolman, gained Sitoli's confidence. He managed to smuggle recording equipment into the prison and taped their conversations. Strangle who beat him? No, I didn't beat anybody. Just strangle. Yeah. How long, how long does it take for somebody to die for me to strangle them? Uh, a few minutes. A few minutes. Is it? Yeah. No, five minutes is too much. Satole described his intense anger toward women. I fully hate a black woman. A woman can hurt you more than a man, more than anybody in this world. On October 21st, 1996, Moses Satole was charged in the Pretoria High Court with 38 murders and 40 rapes. There was uh, much more ladies he raped and killed that uh, we knew about, but there wasn't uh, sufficient evidence to obviously charge him uh, on these uh, cases. More than 140 witnesses testified for the state, including Trifina Mohotzi's best friend, Esther Melango. When we go to the court with Moses Zitole, I was very much scared, but I did go through this uh, court thing, and then we went inside, and then Moses Zitole, he was there. Zitole did his best to intimidate the witnesses. When I was giving my 
story. And then he was just laughing at me and he was shaking his head. DNA linked Satole to the murders, but his jailhouse confession was the most chilling evidence. In the video, he appears relaxed as he boasts about his crimes. If he's right him on the spot, and then the decision, the final decision, you know, here, she must die. She can see it. I, I she died, and she can see it. No chance. Nothing will help you. said one of the women knew karate and that he had struggled with her for hours. Yeah, I gave her a chance to fight. And when we fight, I tell her, if you lose, you die. Outside the courtroom, women banded together and voiced their anger in song. Here they are chanting, why are you killing us, Satole? Why are you killing us? When the crowds heard about Satole's arrogance, they demanded the judge turn him over so they could punish him themselves. The death penalty had been recently abolished in post-apartheid South Africa but the court made certain Satole would never kill again. On December 5th, 1997, with his defense attorney, Eben Jordan, nearby, Moses Satole was sentenced to 2,410 years in prison. He was shocked. He believed throughout that he would be acquitted. I was feeling that, like that, that time, that they must kill him too, because some of the women, they left their children they left their families because of him. Yes, we're happy about the sentence, but we have lost our sister, and my mother lost her daughter. Sitoli was taken from court to the maximum security facility of Pretoria's central prison, where he was held without chance of pardon or parole. Diagnosed with AIDS after his arrest, Satoli received antiviral drugs and benefited from the prison hospital. His wife Martha and Lovu and their daughter Rahit were not as lucky. They were also infected, but like millions of other poor Africans, they did not have the money for medications. Moses Sitole began his terrifying killing spree at a time when black Africans had enormous hopes for the future. At that point in history, he could have made himself uh, into the person that he pretended to be. Instead, he took the lives of 37 women and one child, spreading heartbreak and fear throughout his community. I feel so painful when I, I remember my daughter going out saying he's going to look for work and he never came back. Who they are, where they are from, I didn't care. It's just the type of woman that reminds me of the woman who falsely accused me. And then I just kill her. It is very important to understand they need to feel in control of everything feeling in control, not only of the woman he was killing and raping, but of the whole world around him. Some experts believe that Satole's warped perception of women was formed early in childhood as a result of abuse. But they say even that doesn't explain everything. We cannot say that there's a cause and effect between being abused as a child and then later becoming a criminal because so many people successfully overcome what has happened to them as children. I was out there to 